Drew York Show, live from the ISO radio space in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, it's a beautiful day, and I have a really special guest today. Um, it's somebody that I've wanted to have on the show for a while now, because I think ever since I even got in photography, got into like rap scene, got into like, anything really like in Toronto, he was like always a creative and like supportive force like in my life ever since I met him. So um, yeah, this is a really special occasion. Um, Brendan Hugo, yeah, please come and join me. Absolutely. Thank you for doing this. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I feel like anybody who would be watching this now would probably know you as um, manager of Dylan Ponders and um, a promoter and like show booker. Um, but I wanted to know what's like the earliest um, sort of force of music in your life. Like, what's the? Like how did you even get? How did you even know that music could be something important in your life? Like, how early was that introduced? Wow. Um, early, for sure. I mean, I think for most people, it probably comes from um, being introduced to music growing up, like in your family or household through your parents, um, which I definitely uh, can say, you know, was probably one of the earlier influences and ways that I was introduced to it. But um, from a kind of personal standpoint, I was always definitely, you know, quote unquote, the black sheep. Um, and always kind of had my own personal taste in music and preferences. And actually looking back now, I kind of went through these weird like phases, but literally one of the first phases of music that I went through where I was actually selecting and picking my own music um, probably would have started in grade, probably grade three, four, <laughs> five, six. And it was literally like, and I, and I swear on this, um, hip hop uh, and rap. Um, whether it was, you know, Eminem or D12 or DMX or Snoop Dogg. Mm. Like I remember vividly, um, and shout out to my mom, um, having to have, you know, my mom come in, uh, to the store with me and buy these CDs because they were like, <laughs> yeah. you know, parental advisory, expl explicit <laughs> yeah. content, explicit lyrics. You're like this <laughs> um, and she would not even really knowing what the content was on the CDs cause she wouldn't <laughs> listen to them with me. Um, but she, I guess, trusted that, you know, my taste in music was, was okay. And then, um, I kind of got into a little bit of a, a stereotypical white boy skater phase and got more into like, you know, the punk rock. Uh, the kind of metal Slipknot was one of my favorite bands growing up um, from Autumn to Ashes. Um, and then throughout high school, it kind of just went right back into hip hop urban. Um, and now I will say, I mean, I love all kinds of music, all genres. I'm from Saskatchewan, was born in Saskatoon, grew up on Garth Brooks, I'm still a huge Garth Brooks fan. I remember actually I was at South by probably four years ago, three years ago, and I had the option to either see Gucci Man or Garth Brooks. And it was tough. <laughs> That's crazy. But I'm not going to lie. I went to go see Garth Brooks and uh, <laughs> so and it was funny. and it was amazing and I'm very very happy. Actually, someone <laughs> proposed to his girlfriend right beside me, so that's the power of of Garth. Yeah. Um <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I love that. But yeah, no, I mean I th I think it all kind of stems from uh you know, my parents, they're not like musicians. They never played instruments. But um, even I remember getting driven to like baseball games in the summer and there'd be like Aqua would be playing um, or just like random, you know, um, Phantom of the Opera um, would randomly be in the car and I'd be listening to that. And it was um, or even uh, like, like Les Miserables, like this, the, 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 the soundtracks to those theatrical performances um, and Broadway shows with stuff that um, even 16 like, movie Titanic. I grew up, spent three and a half years in Montreal, like Celine Dion was something that I was always exposed to. <laughs> Shania Twain, like that kind of stuff, right? Different, but, um, you know, still has replay value now and they're legends. So um, I would say that was probably a brief, brief summary of my musical history. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, I know that like your, um, your, at least your path and or journey with, um, throwing concerts and like putting on musical events that started in university. Yep. Um, how did you ever get, how, do you remember the first like event or show that you were ever a part of and how you oh, even like, this is that the, even got, this like, how is, they even came to fruition? This like, is you even thought you could do that. This is the crazy thing. So growing up, I didn't really go to concerts. Like, I swear to God, high school, um, I wasn't going to concerts. Like, I think I went, I saw Lil Wayne at Molson Amphitheater way back. Uh, I saw Kanye West. Um, 
when he came uh, to Molson Amphitheater. Um, I went to a couple like underground garage type punk shows, but to be honest, like I didn't really go to many live events. Um, and it was actually one of my cousins who was living out in Edmonton at the time um, that was doing a lot of promotion and production, mostly on the EDM, electronic DJ side of things. He was booking acts like Avicii, rest in peace, um, back when he was a nobody, Swedish House Mafia, mm. um, you know, Dead Mouse, And that's really what opened up my eyes to the world of like promotions and productions and, you know, producing parties and, and making money off of it and doing your own events. Um, and then I went to the University of Western Ontario and obviously, you know, shout out London. Um, it's definitely, you know, a party town. Um, they love having a good time. They love partying. They love their events. There's always a handful of different promoters and producers, um, some that last longer than others, some that just pop up that are always doing events. And um, it was really in my first year at Western where I kind of saw that culture. Um, mm. The thing that hit me the most, though, was no one was doing hip hop shows. Um, and as much as I respect electronic music and house and, um, you know, that that genre or, or subgenres of music. Um, it just wasn't the type of music that I preferred to listen to or that I cared to listen to. Um, I was always, you know, smoking weed on the blogs, uh, listening to hip hop all, all day, every day. Um, and I was like, I'm noticing something here. At the pre-drinks, everyone's listening to hip hop. Then they go to the club uh, and then they come back. And then at the after parties, it's usually straight back to hip hop and urban music. So I'm like, I know there's obviously a, a demand for this type of music, but no one's really filling it. And the type of hip hop shows that were being produced and, you know, no disrespect obviously to the local promoters, um, but was the type of hip hop that wasn't going to ever appeal to the student demographic. It would be appealing to more of the, the local demographic or like true hip hop heads. Um, so that's kind of for me when I was like, you know what, I want to start producing hip hop shows and I kind of have an idea of how to do it. I need to get a venue and I need to get an artist and I'm just going to start selling tickets. And obviously it's a lot more complex than that. And I, I definitely learned that through trial and error um, and making mistakes and losing money. Um, but I think that's kind of one of the best ways to yeah. learn. Um, and that's kind of how Smash Mouth Entertainment came about. Um, and it's funny now because this is super relevant, obviously now because Smash Mouth, the band, not me, um, has kind of been taking shots at Drake and the Raptors. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just want to kind of clear the air. They were never ever anywhere in the realm of, of my uh, mindset when I came up with right. the branding for Smash Mouth Entertainment and to be completely Because it was honest, about smashing mouths. It wasn't about the yeah, band Smash my Mouth. Thought, my, thought was, <laughs> yeah. my thought was I'm going to come in you know, I'm going to come into the scene uh, with kind of that smash mouth mentality and I'm just going to take what I want and take what's mine. Um, and it was just more of that mindset um, where it came up with smash mouth entertainment. Um, and it literally probably took like two to three months, maybe four months until someone actually made a comment like, oh, like smash mouth the band. And I was just like, fuck. <laughs> but to be honest, I was like, you know what? No, I'm not, I'm not rebranding. I'm not changing yeah. it. I like it. It still speaks to me. The whole mentality, again, that mindset of doing what you want on your terms and taking what you feel is yours um, is still something that I live by to this day. So um, I'm not going to shout out Smash Mouth because I think they're fucking super, super petty and corny. Um, and uh, there is, there's no inspiration there, but I did, I did want to clear the air on that just because the number of people that have hit me up recently being like, oh, free publicity, and I'm just like, nah, not the kind of publicity Fuck Smash Mouth. Fuck Smash Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. But, um, but yeah, speaking, like, speaking on like the origins, actually, shout out, um, shout out Corey Litwin, um, 2020. Uh, he was one of the first individuals that I connected with. We were both going to Western at the time, um, and one of the first ever shows... Uh, that, that we decided to put on and, and put together. One of the first ever shows that Smash Mouth was involved in producing was with Joel Santana, um, and the show never even happened. Um, we sold out. It was, a, it was a venue called Club Rouge. Um, I think it was like 650 tickets, completely sold out, uh, and like two to three days before the show was supposed to happen, Joel's studio got raided in New Jersey, uh, and obviously, you know, drugs, paraphernalia, weapons, and all that were were found. So he had some legal issues, um, and you know, ended up not being able to get across the border. 
um, and we had to do you know a complete refund and we thought about rescheduling but obviously uh, that never happened and that was literally one of my first experiences producing um, a show and producing a concert was a show that never actually happened. Yeah, how did, how did through, that not like destroy? How did that not like fuck you up? The like, worst part about it is literally having all of the money physically in your hands because you, we were selling obviously hand to hand tickets at the time. There was oh very small <laughs> amount that was done online and having to sit at the venue. And I remember Corey and I did it. We sat there and had people come and get refunds. And you're literally handing back obviously their money that they bought for all tickets, but your money. profit. Everything, everything, everything yeah. handing it all back. And we obviously incurred <laughs> our losses because we had expenses that we couldn't recoup. Um, but again, I mean, that's all part of, I don't think you'll meet anyone that's ever produced a show or produced a concert that hasn't taken an L. And that yeah. was not the only L I've ever taken by, by far, not the only L I've ever taken. Fortunately, looking back, I've had more wins than losses, but I mean, it was, if anything, it was motivating because it showed me that there's a demand and there was a market for it. Um, it just Clearly, was something yeah. that was out of our control, you know, yeah. and then one of my other early shows, and this is probably the one show that I think really established myself in Smash Mouth, um, which is ironic because it literally was the first show that we ever did, um, was the Smokers Club Tour, um, October 1st, 2010 at the Opera House, um, with Currency, Big Crit, Smoke Dizza, Mac Miller, obviously rest in peace, um, and that was an event again didn't sell out but probably did i think we did just over 700 tickets and opera house is right around 800. Mm -hmm. um so pretty much a near sellout um and i still lost money of course um, yeah. <laughs> and of course and and that was simply because i did not know how to properly structure the back end of a show um it's my numbers my structure was just completely out of whack i spent i mean I, I gave these guys like a half pound of weed in the green room just to smoke. Yeah. Who what find me another promoter that's that's giving a half pound of weed for these guys to smoke. Now not here, definitely. No, like not, that, that'd not, probably be more common in like the States. Right? But not not, not, more money not more in Toronto. Not here, no. Um <laughs> and uh, it was one of those things where but again, for, in terms of relationships with the artists, this whole idea of the smash mouth hospitality, I still get phone calls to this day from people saying they've been referred to me through another artist, from another artist where they're like, yo, as soon as you touch down in Toronto, you gotta hit our boy, Brandon at Smash Mouth, he'll take care of you. And that was something that I actually, you know, I prided myself on and I was very proud of was knowing that when artists come to Toronto, it's not more, it's more than just a business interaction, it's more than just a show, it's I want, you know, if you need a barber, I'll get you one. If you need a, a tattoo artist, I'll get you one. If you just wanna know the good spots to go and get food, I'll take care of you. Whatever you need, like I'll, I'll be there. Not just making a phone call, like I'm gonna pick you up, I'm gonna do it myself. And fortunately for me, that was one of the things that helped get Smash Mouth positioned early on um, in the marketplaces because I took the time to try to build those genuine relationships with the artists um, so that every time they decided to tour again or, or hit the road, um, they would go to their booking agent and say, hey, by the way, in Toronto, we wanna work with Brennan at Smash Mouth. Uh, as long as his offer is competitive, that's who we're working with. If his, obviously, if someone's willing to pay more money than me, then take the money. I get that, but tried to get my foot in the door with that right of first refusal, um, and that was something that really, really, really helped me early on, and and something that I can say like to this day is something that still, you know, comes back. I'm still working with you know the Flatbush Zombies. I'm still working with Joey Badass. I'm still working with the Underachievers. I'm still working with Big Crit, Smoke Dizza. Um, a lot of these artists, you know, shout out Black. Um, yeah. That teams and camps that I continuously maintain that relationship with um, and it's good business for the both of us they're getting what they want and I'm getting what I want and it's positioned me where um, other bigger production companies and promoters or you know, booking agencies have to come work with me now I might be the small guy I might be the independent guy but based off those real genuine relationships I've been able to maintain a brand um, and kind of position myself. I would say there's maybe 20% of the artists that I've worked with, 25% of the artists that I've worked with out of the 80 to 100 um, that I no longer have positive relationships with, which I'm pretty happy about. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, that's always something I've seen from from like the audience perspective or from like a media perspective or something like that. It's that it's like, you're consistently bringing a lot of the same guys and like doing good numbers at all these shows. Like it's like consistent. And it actually so speaking on that, it's crazy. Cause I've literally seen like watching artists, like even Mac Miller again, rest in peace. Um, he was an opener on the smokers club tour. He went on before smoke Dizza, Uh, and now people would be like Mac Miller 
Smoke is and no disrespect to Smoke. That's, that's yeah, the course. homie. Um, one of the most talented artists I've ever been around and by far one of the most genuine. Um, but again, like I mean, Mac really reached some incredible heights um, and obviously was an incredibly talented individual, but kids had just dropped um, and he probably had 50 fans that you could clearly tell came out to see him, which was actually looking back on it now pretty impressive for, you know, 17, eight, I think he was 17 at the time, um, 18. He had an issue getting into the venue after he performed because he wasn't, he wasn't 19 and it was a 19 plus show. Yeah. Um, drove crazy. up from Pittsburgh um, in his own van, did his own thing, shout out Q. Um, and in less than six months, he came back to Toronto at the Opera House, same venue, sold it out. And then he came back in July, I believe, and sold out Cool House back-to-back -back nights. So in less than a year, he went from opening up being the third or fourth support act to selling out an 800-person venue to then doing Cool House back-to-back -back nights. Like, and to see that kind of like meteoric rise um, and to have you know a role in that and then obviously to go see him move on to venues like Rebel and you know, even much larger rooms than that was, is pretty special. Um, even like the beast coast guys, like I remember booking Flatbush zombies, um, at wrong bar where they could do like a hundred tickets, 150. Tickets. I couldn't get into that show. You know? My fake ID. Like, <laughs> I, got, like, one of, I got like one of those like young street, like shitty. One of those like I'm from New Jersey IDs or whatever. From, like a yeah. gift, gift shop. Yep, yep. And then the security guard took one look Shout at out it. those guys, man. You held me under his <laughs> drink for a very long time. The security um, guard took like one look at it and he's just like, no. <laughs> but even I remember, man, and that show is crazy to me because I remember um, they uh, they were traveling. They actually got to the border uh, and they realized they had some tabs on them still um, that they didn't r recall or remember having. So they were like, "Fuck!" Either we try to cross the border, you know, with these tabs in our pockets, or we just fucking take them. Um, and they decided that they were just going to take them. And by the time they got to Toronto uh, and got on stage, their mid trip. Uh, performing high as fucking balls on acid, uh, and they killed it. Um, and uh, I don't know how they did it. Shout out to them. Kudos to them. Um, <laughs> but that's something that I'll never forget. I'm sure it's probably something that they'll never forget. Um, and now to see where they're at now in their career, um, even the underachievers. I remember bringing them up here and you know having them stay at my condo, um, just sleeping on the couch and in my in in my second bedroom, um, to seeing them, Joey Badass, doing shows with him at Wrong Bar during North by Northeast. You always knew he was going to be something special, but he hadn't quite gotten to that point. And now here we are, you know, they're doing stadium tours just with their inner family, the Beast Coast, all those guys, Pro Air, obviously Joey, um, you know, Kirk, uh, CJ, now the Flatbush Zombies, UA, yeah, um, they've Powers. Yeah, they've done an amazing job. It's of, absurd. Of, and the one thing that I respect. Cultivating that fan base. Huge. And organically, it's super genuine. Super engaged. Um, super engaged. Like, the merch drops are crazy. Like the flap, I, I still get those emails. Like the flap or zombie merch drop because I've been subscribed to that newsletter to me, probably for a million years. It's and one like, of the most. It still like sells out like instantly. The amount of respect I have for their team and everyone involved in that movement and what they've been able to do and staying true to themselves is incredible. Yeah. Like that's a blueprint to follow. Yeah. Um, and bringing each other up. You know what I mean? Like that that sense of loyalty to one another. Um, no one in that in, in that entire collective has ever let fame or money or success push them away or make them feel more important than the next person. Like yeah. I've never seen anyone. Every tour Flatbush goes on, they have people that are genuinely related to them through friendship um, on their bill. Whether it's one of the pro era guys, Bodega Bams, always, yeah, Dizza, always, yeah, always. Um, same with the underachievers, you know what I mean? They're um, seemingly not letting anybody sort of influence, like, oh, you should put this person on nope. for this reason, they, or put they, this person on for their problem. They stick they to their guns, or... and that's what's made them who they are, and that's what's built the brand for all of them, respectively. And that's like, yeah, for me, I, I've done enough shows, I've been involved with enough productions where, like, I don't get, like, giddy um, very easily, or I don't feel like a fan most days anymore because I've been in the industry for so long. But that's a show where I'm genuinely going to be, you know, side stage or in the stage, um, in the crowd. Sorry, uh, just like genuinely enjoying the music because yeah. to see that come full circle 
is just incredible. Like really, really special to me to even just know that I played a sliver of a, a part in helping build yeah, that. Yeah, even just having here. just helping facilitate that. Yeah, and that's what, obviously what it's all about to me. Like it's always been about the music, uh, music that I believe in, and trying to help bring that to Toronto uh, or the surrounding markets, Canada in general. And there's lots yeah. of artists that I've supported that I thought would blow up and make it huge and they just haven't for various reasons. And yeah. then there's artists that you knew, like Kendrick, for instance, is one of those artists where I remember bringing him to Toronto for his, his first ever show. I think it was 2012. High Power had just dropped like two weeks before we did the show. Like so early in his career, Section 80 hadn't even come out yet. And we were trying to sell him to people, sell him and, and promote as to why you need to come and, is and that the show that the remix project was a part of? Right. So the remix. I, I, was, I saw a flyer or something for it, like a throwback, like recently yep. for it, and they were it. They were people. Someone, whoever was posting that, had described it the same way that like people didn't believe. Like they, no, people, you had it to, was like, like were, people were really trying to sell them on it. Selling it, and um, it was crazy because we did that show at Sound Academy. Um, we got a hook up there. Shout out uh, Jonathan Ramos, the OG. Um, he helped us string that one together. We we're working with yeah, Drex and Gavin and Addy and the whole remix team because um, we were all just like sold on this this kid Kendrick yeah. is going to be something special. And actually, it's crazy because I had worked with Absol prior to this. Um, I was and still to this day I'm a diehard Absol fan. Um, that's the homie, but he, huge, huge, huge fan of his music. He was on tour with Murs, Paid Dues tour, um, and I remember working with him. And I said to him, I'm like, man. I remember we were sitting at the uh, in the green room at Wrong Bar, um, and I was like, "We have to get Schoolboy Q." You know, was incredible, and that was someone we tried to get we tried to get over as well. But obviously, for unforeseen circumstances, that wasn't possible for a few years. But I was like, "How do we get Kendrick to Toronto?" And he put me in touch with Dave Free, who's one of the the presidents now over at at Top Dog Entertainment, um, and we kind of just figured out the paperwork and everything that they needed to make it happen. And that bill initially was supposed to be Kendrick, Schoolboy, and Absol. But Schoolboy got held up at the border uh, in Toronto at Pearson Airport. Like, he literally got on the plane. He was here at the yeah, airport. Yeah. Didn't get let through. Um, so it ended up just being Kendrick and, and Ab. Um, but that's probably one of my greatest memories um, from, like, the early Smash Mouth days. Kendrick turned 24 uh, the night of the concert. We had the cake brought out for him, and it was just, again, to be able to celebrate in that kind of moment with an artist now that has gone on to become arguably yeah. one of the greatest artists of all time um, yeah. is, is crazy. And even, again, super early, um, but the industry was paying attention. I remember he was in Toronto. We had him here, um, and obviously Drake and the OVO guys started reaching out, and they were, they were really wanting to meet him. Um, they knew he was in Toronto. They had a show here. Um, so they were here for about four days. Uh, and I remember, you know, talking about it and we weren't sure if it was going to happen or not. And, you know, we were trying to make arrangements for them to meet. And it kind of got to the point where it almost felt like, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. It wasn't going to happen because his schedule was too busy. And then I remember we we're at the hotel um, and we were actually staying at the Best Westin um, right at uh, right at Jarvis and Carlton. That's now a student residence. Um, and I remember uh, Dave got the phone call and it was just, you know, meet us at Harbor 60 in 30 minutes. And they were just like, yo, like, we're going to meet Drake. Um, and Ab was fucking passed out high as shit. And he actually skipped coming to meet Drake because he was too high. He opted to sleep at the hotel. So it was just me, Dave That's and Kendrick. Crazy. And we pulled up. As soon as we walked in, they knew exactly who we were here to see, probably because we weren't dressed like any of the other business guys that were sitting there having dinner and walked down. You know, they had the private room booked out um, and we sat there talking for probably like two hours. And for me, I just got to kind of be a fly on the wall and just watch the first, probably one of the first ever, I, to my knowledge, the first time Kendrick and Drake ever met um, and just watching them interact and just share stories. And, and Drake was a genuine fan of what he had heard up to that point. And uh, he had an early flight to New York the next day. Kendrick obviously um, made sure he got a copy of Section 80 before he left and wanted him to hear it and just kind of seeing how that relationship um, kind of, you know, came about. But even just seeing that that moment kind of immortalized in 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 hip hop history, talking about the, the interlude that he had on Take Care where, you know, 40 pulls up, doors missing on the Jeep. And it's like, I remember that vividly standing outside Harbor 60, mm. having 40 pull up in his Jeep 
doors aren't on it, obviously, in summer mode. Um, so that, that was pretty cool and something that I'll always um, kind of kind of hold close to me. Um, un- you know, unfortunately, there were some falling outs after the fact. I don't do much work with TDE um, and those guys uh, anymore, uh, but that's just business. It is what it is. Uh, I got nothing but respect for that entire camp. Again, Absol's the homie. Um, love his music. Kendrick, J-Rock especially. Um, Schoolboy, like all super, super dope. And again, like a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal um, instrumental part of my career and you know the brand that I've been trying to build through Smash Mouth and I hope something that for those people that were at that show in Toronto can always look back at and say like I experienced Kendrick at a point in his career where it was so intimate and raw but still so evident about who he was going to be and what he's become um, and that was kind of one of the main reasons why I even got into to music promotion and production in the first place was to try to bring that talent to Toronto at a point in its career timeline where the big promoters and the and, and the big um, you know producers weren't preying on it yet because it wasn't guaranteed. I lost money on that show. Yeah. But the source and Double XL and all these big Q, uh, you know U.S. hip hop publications immediately the next day we're all reporting Kendrick Lamar sells out debut Toronto show because the angles of how we filmed everything made it look sold out. That mm. venue we did 600 people at Sound Academy. That's not. That's, that's, that's not a sold out show. It looked good though. That's Perce- crazy. Perception. That's crazy. <laughs> Perception. Um, I really wanted to ask you. Um, I wish we had like I wish we had like a whole other like half hour to discuss this, but I I, I want to ask you the what you remember about the first time you met Dylan Ponders because that's been like probably the one of the projects. Dylan you've been Ponders. On yeah. So this is ah, Dylan Ponders. Um, I didn't think he was a real person for a long time because and <laughs> and and what I mean by that is um my boy set shout out set um was actually someone uh I started working with professionally I started managing set first and set is obviously one of Dylan's longest friends and one of his best friends childhood yeah. friends and set was the one who told me you need to hear Dylan Ponders you got to listen to his music I'm going to put you on to him and he did and I was instantly sold like instantly sold um that was right around the time you know the weekend was really coming out and 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 really making some noise and uh without putting dylan in like a box or anything like that um he just really had a similar dark eerie kind of after hours drug influenced sex influenced sound but more of a raw hip-hop rap side of it instead of like the r&b crooning side of it um and I immediately reached out to him and I was like, man, like we got to sit down, we got to meet. Um, and it took us about five weeks to meet. Uh, I wouldn't get responses for three, four days. Uh, he wouldn't have a phone. He would just completely ghost. He wouldn't show up. And I was managing a producer at the time, Batman on the Beats. Shout out Batman. Wow, um, shout out Batman on the Beats. <laughs> shout out Bat. Wow. Um, and we and him had this running joke, like he's not a real person. He's just not real. Yeah. And Dylan had just dropped a project called Overdose at the time. Still one of my favorite projects to date, probably because that's what put me onto him. So it kind of holds a special place with me. But um, finally we connected and I sat down and I just said, man, like, this is what I can offer you. Um, This is what my plan is for you. Um, I don't want you to sign any paperwork. I don't want you to sign any contracts. I just want to put in work uh, and essentially show and prove um, and build a genuine relationship because I think you're something... um, that the world is going to embrace. Um, I think you have a talent, obviously, um, but there's a uniqueness to it. Um, and now looking back on that, obviously, we've been, we've been working together now for over five years. Um, the career trajectory obviously wasn't what we had both anticipated, but I wouldn't change any of it. Um, I feel like having that marathon mentality and going through those trials and tribulations and um, really feeling things out. Um, we're building an infrastructure that no matter how hard you shake it, it's never going to fall. Um, and I think that will say something once all is said and done. I feel like taking the long route, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, um, especially when you're really building something genuine and, and grassroots and organic. Um, and I'm just really excited for the next chapter. I mean, I've, I was excited for the last you know five chapters, but um, I think we're at a point in his career where everything is really coming full circle and timing is something that you can't force. I don't believe in luck, but I believe in timing. I'm just going to reset the camera so we can keep talking about this. (laughs) A few moments later. 
Sick. Yeah, no, I thought we were just going over half an hour, but I like, I want to keep talking about Dylan Ponders. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> yo, and I was going to say, yeah, like, I don't believe in, I don't believe in luck, uh, in Shadow Brian Espiritu, um, obviously one of the Toronto OGs and one of the, one of the most brilliant creative minds I personally have come across. Um, he has that infamous fuck luck brand and logo that he's designed, and I actually have it tattooed on my, on, uh, on my bicep, and it was something that just always really hit home um, the first time I heard it, like, fuck luck. And I used to always think like you need a little bit of luck in life and you need this, but you, you yeah. don't need luck. You need timing. And the way you get timing on your side is by working fucking hard and, 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 and grinding and putting in those hours and putting in that time to position yourself to be able to take advantage of an opportunity when it comes. A lot of people have opportunities come and pass by them because they weren't able to take advantage of it because they hadn't worked hard enough or they weren't ready for it or they blew up too soon and they didn't know how to sustain it and they fumble it and they yeah. drop it. Um, and it takes that perfect combination um, to be able to realize your potential at the right time. And for Dylan, you know, maybe if, if things would have um, caught traction six months after I met him, he was at a point in his life where um, you know, he was abusing substances and he, I mean, that's my brother. I love him to death. So I can say some of these things. He was a junkie. He was an addict. Absolutely. There were times where I yeah. thought he was going to die and he probably would have, if we came into success at that point in time, he probably would have gone on the road and you know what I mean? And ended up being, one I of think he would artists, agree with you probably, you know, yeah. absolutely. Or we would have fucked up the label deal or we would have fucked up a situation here or offended someone or, you know, and, um, he wasn't ready yet. He's now, yeah. you know, had, you know, not hundreds of performances, but you know, 20, 30, you know, large scale shows. He's toured Canada. He's open for, um, you know, huge artists, anywhere from 500 person crowds to, you know, 4,000 person crowds. Um, he's been in a lot of different situations. He's been in a room with 10 people and won them over. He's been in a room with 3000 people and won them over. Um, he's experienced a lot of different things that I think have, have led him to a different, point in his life where he has certain appreciation but also a hunger and a desire for knowing what it takes um, to be successful and have a sustainable career I'm not chasing you know success if it only lasts for four months or five months like I want to build careers and if it takes five yeah. years to have a 20-year career I'm okay with that it's better than being around for one year and, and then disappearing right so I do think that you can't force timing and and based on kind of how things have just been happening the last like six to eight months, especially um, in 2019, I couldn't be more excited for you know this next chapter. We got a lot in the works, uh, a lot of new music coming, um, a lot of exciting collaborations, um, and just some really some really cool plans. I mean, the one thing that I respect the most about Dylan, and I and I would hope that most people would 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 feel the same and say the same is, um, he's just a very genuine artist um, and person. What you see and what you hear is what you get. Um, yeah, exactly. And with all the good and all yeah. the bad. Yeah. That's it. Um, you're not going to hear, listen to his album uh, and then go meet him and be like, fuck, that's not what I was expecting. Or like, damn, you know, he's, that's all show. You know what I mean? Like, that's all fabricated. Um, none of that's real. And I'm used to that because I, I see a lot of these, you know, famous artists um, in the flesh, what, you know, who they are and when they're not on stage, when they're not on camera. And there's a lot of them that are as, genuine as Dylan and that to me always resonates when you meet someone and they're exactly what you thought they were going yeah, to be yeah. it's really special um, and then there's artists where you're just like fuck like, I kind of wish I hadn't met you I kind of I kind of wish that I hadn't you know had these interactions because now I'm not going to listen to your music the same like the music's cool but like you're not a yeah. great person or it's all show and you know you're, you're portraying something that you're not which again that's the entertainment industry and we all know that that's what you know we got into this industry and yeah. with it comes a lot side of that but um, again like I feel like Dylan specifically and that's one thing that's always gravitated me towards him um, is just that you know genuineness and um, staying true to who he is and as much as I might be trying to make him go in different directions because I'm a businessman at the end of the day and I am trying to maneuver this industry in a way where I'm not asking him to compromise but I'm asking him um, to understand that this is a chess game and you have to be strategic with how you move. But yeah. that's the one thing that I always have the utmost respect for is he knows who he is and what he wants. Um, and he always keeps that as his number one priority. Um, and if that means yeah. not having a top 40 hit or being on the radio, then that's what that means, right? But there's success means different things to different people. Um, and to know that we're reaching 
you know, the demographic that we are and we are impacting people's lives, whether it's two kids, 50 kids, a thousand kids, half a million kids, like that, that speaks for itself. It's right? funny that you mentioned radio because it's, um, if he had stopped making music three years ago or even two years ago, um, his music would have never been played on the radio. No, and never. now in 2019, there is a platform, however, still growing. It's right. the platform that plays Toronto music on the radio. Yes, you know, like which is which is yeah, and that's and that's actually crazy too. I mean, obviously, Shadow Flow, um, Mastermind, obviously Ricochet, um, <laughs> like everyone, everyone, everyone over there, huge, 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 um, you know, amounts of respect uh, for taking that initiative. Like they brought him in for like interviews. Like it's like you know, it's like that. that it's like that. Even however, if like you could, you could argue that that's not the hugest impact nowadays in terms of like exposure and media, but it's like that wouldn't have been happening years ago. And it's like the fact that he has kept at it and like people like Mastermind and Ricochet, they have kept at sort of fighting this fight. It's like, it, well, and that's what you can see how it's funny because like now, now they're in the same room together and on, like on the, on the air. Yeah. Well, I was just saying, <laughs> you I know? mean, putting in, putting in time. And I mean, I think that that does say something. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, if you were to ask Dylan, would you, you know, are you happy with where you're at? He would say no. Because he's an ambitious yeah. individual. And I'm an ambitious individual. And obviously, we know, you know, the levels that we're able to obtain and the levels that, that we will obtain. Um, and I feel like if you ever grow complacent, then you've already lost the battle if you're just comfortable. Yeah, people always ask, yeah, people always ask me, like, oh, like, you know, how are things going? Or how, you know, and I just always say, it's like, I don't fucking know. Like, there's a lot of shit in my head, and right? it's not in real life yet. And well, that drives me insane. No, actually, <laughs> and being able to, I mean, obviously, and it's easy to get frustrated and to get, you know, yeah. broken down and beat yourself up and say, <laughs> I deserve this, I want this, I want that. But um, it's really, really important to, to just obviously stay the course and um, follow your gut and know what you believe in and what you stand for and just execute. That's all. literally all you can do is just have a plan and execute. Um, and as long as you do the right things, like and, and, and that's the reality of the situation too, is success isn't inevitable for anyone. Yeah. Not for me, not for you. It doesn't matter who it's you are. It's never guaranteed. It's, it's nothing's never, guaranteed. You, you could have, things right. right. Yeah. And that's just the unfortunate side of reality. Yeah. <laughs> which yeah. sucks and it's daunting and it's kind of depressing to think about, but that's also the reality. And I feel like that's something that you also can't lose focus of, um, but that needs to help fuel the fire, right? You have a time frame, um, and I think you always have to be measuring where you're at. And if you actually have not gone anywhere, then maybe there is a real point in time where you need to reevaluate what you're doing. Um, I love when people chase their dreams. I love when people, um, you know, go after what they want but don't starve and end up homeless because of something that that you have in your head that you think you deserve yeah. or that a lifestyle that you think you want like it does come a point in time where you know they, they always have the definition of like a starving artist but the starving artist doesn't need to starve you can go get a nine to five you can go work some odd end jobs here just to pay the rent and keep your lights on and some food in your belly because are you even really able to chase your dreams if if, if you're fucking malnourished yeah, like and Ponders you can't a good example sleep, of that. like, you, you know what at, I mean? You like, at, you look at Ponders and it's like, Ponders wants to be a rapper. Right. With a big audience and touch the world. And it's like, yeah, you know, maybe he could do that if he just made rap music all day long and just crashed from couch to couch. But like, he did that for a while. And you know, it's like, that's like, he made, he he made certain, not, not sacrifice necessarily, but certain like, um, it is a sacrifice in yeah, a I guess sense. So. I mean, yeah, like yeah, to go and get a nine to five, something that I mean, fortunately for him, he's been able to find, you know, employment in an industry that he enjoys cannabis. He loves yeah. cannabis, which is which is fortunate for That's him. Very but on brand. Is that what he <laughs> wants to be doing? No, of course he'd rather be in the studio all day making music, recording music, rehearsing, um, you know, conceptualizing, you know, treatments and, 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 and creative ideas. But it's just like, if you can't invest in yourself, who's going to invest in you? If you're not willing to take the sacrifice to go out and ensure that you can live a quality of life to sustain your career or support your career, then who else is supposed to come in and do yeah, it? Yeah, I'm, I'm always way more impressed when I 
whenever I meet some like new musician or new artist and I find out that they have a microphone and a condenser and a little setup at their house. Right. And it's like, that's sick because at least from my perspective, it's like you actually care. Like you, even if it's not going to be the best quality, like you can record all these references and you record all these ideas. You can work at any time of the day, whenever it hits you. When you go to like spend money on that studio, you don't have to just fucking dance around and drink and smoke and like figure out what you're going to record. Like people that, yeah, people that have like, I don't know. I think that there's just so much to be said for that. Well, and again, and and I think part of that is going through, there are artists that start making music and in two months they've got a record deal or they're being flown out places and they don't get to experience that, that struggle, that grind. But I think if most artists who have gone through those phases, um, I don't think any of them would, would ever tell you they regret it. I don't think anyone would look back on those really tough times, those trying times, and would tell you, like, you know, I wish I gave up or I wish I didn't do this. Or um, I think it makes people. Uh, it can break people, too. Um, but I think those experiences, and again, as I said before, like just being in a position where you can actually take advantage of an opportunity when it presents itself, all of those things put you in a position where, you now get that first advance, you get that first deal, and you're not just gonna go blow it on some jewelry and some designer shit because you know what and how far that, that money can actually go and what it can actually do. Um, you know, fin- I think financial literacy is one of the most important things ever, and if that even just means finding a job to help you support your means, pay your rent, put food on the table, and put a little bit of money aside every paycheck to reinvest in your career, music video, photo shoots, travel, okay, so all of a sudden you have an opportunity, but you need to be in LA next week, you can't afford to go. That sucks to be you. Mm-hmm. There's an opportunity that you can't cash in on. Why? Yeah, because 100%. you're too busy making music and they couldn't even have a job to even just have that reserve fund to go and chase something. What, you think a label is just going to fly you out the first time? Obviously, for some people, yes. But like just little things like that, like invest in yourself. Yeah. That's the one thing that drives me nuts when people tell me, like, I don't need a job because I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> it's just like, it's so backwards. It's so, so backwards. But, um, what I know you've been like the last year or so you've been like working on a variety of different things and like it like there's like new artist things there's new like cannabis things there's new event things yeah like um what's like most exciting to you right now that you've been sort of like talking about or working on or like things that you can actually talk about I guess yeah I mean it's for me I always believe in keeping like a very diverse portfolio um I like to monetize passion um and for me my main passions are obviously like entertainment music fitness and cannabis um cannabis obviously has been something that i've been involved in on multiple you know sides of the industry since early days in high school you know it was something that i always consumed uh it was something that i always used something that i was always excited about something that i always believed in the culture behind it obviously cannabis and, and hip hop and the music industry and, and creatives, you know, is a very predominant aspect of that. Now I will say this, I haven't, I haven't actually smoked in, um, coming up to 14, 14 weeks now, yeah. um, which is the longest that I've gone in the last like seven and a half years. So, um, taking a little bit of a cleanse and a little bit of a break, which has been nice. Um, but it's still something that again, I mean, it's always going to play a role in in my life in some regard obviously especially now that i'm a lot more invested in the legal industry um which is something that i'm super super excited about like again you know i've always had a green thumb um pun intended and to to be able to take advantage of the emergence of such a huge industry um and play you know some somewhat of a role in helping shape that and be a part of what this behemoth can become uh is super exciting um, like never in my life did I think that, you know, cannabis was going to be legalized and it was going to become this, you know, billion dollar industry. And I was actually going to be able to be involved in it from day one. Yeah. Um, now that obviously comes with timing again. I was at the right age, you know, I'm not 50 years old and even 50 year olds are getting in on the industry. But and I wasn't, you know, 16 years old and not able to get into it. Uh, not that say that 16 year olds, you know, can't get into it now. You sh- shouldn't be smoking cannabis because you're not of age. But um, yeah, <laughs> uh, no, but um, again, again, like timing was everything. So I have I have a couple of different ventures that I'm working on on, on the cultivation side, uh, on the retail side. Um, which I'm, you know, super, super excited about. Um, I can't really dive into too many details now, uh, but over, you know, the next six to eight months, um, anyone that knows me or um, interacts with me on, on any level, um, you'll obviously be hearing a lot more about that. Um, and then like on the music side, I mean, you know, Smash Mouth is, is 
um, the backbone of everything that I do. Um, it's something that I literally embody. Um, it's me, um, just in corporate form. Um, we're still going to be doing all our shows, the productions. Obviously, again, we, we evidently have taken a step back in that regard, uh, which was something that was very conscious. Um, I'm not going out of my way to book new artists uh, and produce shows just for the sake of booking new artists and producing shows. I put a lot more of, of my focus on the management and development side, and I've also obviously taken a step back to focus on some of these other newer ventures that are emerging um, and the cannabis side is, as well. So a lot of the pre-existing relationships, um, we're going to continue to work with those artists, obviously. Um, if there are certain artists that really jump out at me uh, as someone that I just need to have my hand in or I want my brand involved in their story, then I obviously will make an effort to go out of, of my way to try to do that. Um, new Dylan music, obviously, coming soon. Uh, Jimmy... Um, is going to be releasing some new music um, for anyone that that knows Smash Mouth or knows me um, should know Jimmy B. Um, he's going to be coming back in the next uh, you know four to six months. Really, really excited about that. He took a couple years off uh, a personal hiatus, and um, you know that's been that's been one of my best friends for the last six years, and someone that I'm extremely um, excited about helping share this new body of work uh what he's been working on you know with the masses and um i'm working with a new client from ottawa named talk um shout out to drew shout out to talk. that is actually <laughs> how i met talk uh and no one that's watching this is going to know anything about talk probably for some time because we're being very strategic with the rollout but when it is time to unleash talk on the masses um i think it's going to be something really special and something that anyone who knows Nick um, and anyone who's heard his music or has interacted with him um, would, would attest to and would agree with. It's, it's, it's going to be great. Um, and this is the man right here um, <laughs> that helped make all that happen and really connected the dots. So that, that's a chapter that hasn't even started yet. That, that is going to be super, um, super special. So that's coming. Um, and I mean, just being a part of the Toronto music scene in general, to be honest, is something that that that's special um just seeing where everyone is at there's so many you know people that i was involved with five years ago four years ago three years ago on the management side or on the consulting side pr side or just helping them book shows that are genuinely achieving success yeah, internationally like I, like I think about even like two that come to mind i think you put me on to new yeah and shout you out put new. me on to toby Shout out Toby. There's like two guys that in even the last like year or so have done like really well, you know, like it, compared to where they were at like four years ago when, or three years ago when Absolutely. you would have shown I me. I mean, yeah. yeah, New obviously has been doing his thing. Um, that's something that, that I think a lot of us saw coming for a very long time. And again, timing is everything, you know. Yeah. Um, super excited to see where that where that goes and, and where that team continues to, to take themselves. Um, and then Toby, I mean, I don't think enough can be said about, about Toby. That, that is something yeah. that is just such a special talent uh, and even, you know, a great talent, even greater person, that whole team that's involved behind the scenes there, um, you know, they just know exactly what they're doing and they're executing and nothing excites me more than execution. Like I love to yeah, see I people execute um, because yeah. people only see what the surface, right? No one sees what goes on behind the scenes and the amount of time and the hours and um, the sacrifices and the blood, sweat, and, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, obviously, and the amount of, you know, psychological and like mental and physical exertion and, and stress and um, what goes into bringing all of this to life and yeah. making this a reality um, and actually bringing that vision to fruition and, you know, really conceptualizing that um, and, and help having it see the light of day. Um, so to see that roll out and I know how hard those guys have been working. So that was, that was really special. Um, yeah. super excited to kind of see where, where they take things. Um, and I mean, and there's a handful of other artists, um, all of Toronto really. I mean, even just looking at what Jesse Reyes and Daniel Caesar, um, what they've been able to do this year, it's, uh, in, in the last couple of years, it's just motivating, like really, 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 really motivating. And to see the city of Toronto just really embracing um, their role on a global scale, the role that we always knew we could play uh, and, you know, what we always knew we deserved um, is now really happening, you know, right in front of our eyes. And even 
the, the, the run the Raptors are going on. I don't know when this is going to get released, but obviously the Raptors are going to the finals, which is crazy. And like just just moments like that, it's just like Toronto's just getting wins. We're just getting wins. Uh, and to be a part of that in, in any way, shape, or form is just special. So I would say like that's one of the things I'm most excited about um, is just being a part of this culture, being a part of this community here, um, and just playing my role. And I feel like on a, on a grand scale, that's just what everyone needs to do. Just play your role, yeah, and everything else works itself out. And know what that role is, and just do it well. Yeah, it does feel just like such a well. special time, right? Yeah, no, it's great. It's crazy. I mean, it's all obviously like right now because they're going to the finals. Obviously, it does feel like a it really like special yep. time. But like, I think in general, it does feel like I it's think exciting. the summer approaching and makes me like really excited. And yeah, like, like if you're if you're happy. a young creative, you know, young entrepreneur, um, even if you're just you know someone that's just you know aspiring to be the best version of you. Yeah. Like just that's all you can be. Like, it is a great place to be right yeah, now. Yeah. It's 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 definitely uh lots of good vibes. Um and I think positive, you know, positive energy which is what society and the world needs um with everything else that's going on. Um not that I'm turning this into a, a political conversation yeah. by any means cuz that's not that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> um but no, it's definitely I mean it's it's special especially with just um where things are at in the world um i think yeah we come from a very special city full of some very special people um and i'm just yeah happy to be a part of that okay i need two toronto food recommendations from you Ooh, two toronto food Fire recommendations only. fuck man my favorite place ever is no longer is no longer with us rest in peace pacific junction hotel they had the best poutine spring rolls ever Damn. and i would always make people come to pgh anyone who knows me if you had a meeting with me just socialize with me you probably had to come to pacific junction hotel at, at some point in time now i think i think they actually might have moved the the poutine spring rolls over to betty's which is just down the street uh same ownership group so interesting i'm now gonna pick betty's only because <laughs> i mean don't get me wrong betty's has good food if you like pub food bar food but poutine spring rolls uh with the oxtail gravy um, wow, at Betty's wow. um, is something that you absolutely, absolutely have to try. Um, that's just something that, again, it's more of a kind of an East End Toronto staple and something that just speaks to me personally. So I got to I got to I got to put that on um, that on there for people. Um, and then a second, uh, a second food recommendation. Oh, man. Um, oh, I'm trying to think. Um, whew. Who's going to take this spot? Um, I can't recall the name. King Solomon and Queen Sheba. King Solomon and Queen Sheba, Ethiopian, Ethiopian restaurant. restaurant. Literally right at Queen and Parliament. Um, absolutely incredible. Great people, great ownership. Um, and I always tend, I mean, I like these small little food spots. Oh my God, I have one more. Okay, I yeah. have one more. I love spots like that. Gale Snack Bar at Carlon Eastern. The most expensive thing on the menu is $3.75. That's my kind of place. For a roast beef sandwich. That's I kid you not, place. shout out Gail, <laughs> you are an absolute legend. Um, you can get a homemade clubhouse sandwich with a full plate of fries for like $2.75. I kid you not. I don't know how she does it. I don't know how she pays her bills. <laughs> I rate you. Um, and I hope that you don't go Shout anywhere. Out Gail, Shout out to Gales. So those would be my, my three picks. That's so funny. Okay. Thank you for doing this, man. Of course, brother. I appreciate you. Awesome. Okay. Coming, coming, coming to you live. <laughs> Thank you for watching the Drew York Show. Yeah, until next time.